So, uh, hi. So, welcome to um, the session again. We uh, stopped at the goals of the course and how typology is going to help you or typological research is going to help you to understand linguistics as a discipline better, right? So, now let's see what is typological study of languages. When I say um, this course focuses on typological approach, the very first question that comes that comes to your mind is why typological study is important and how it's going to be significant to understand linguistics as a discipline. So, I'll just begin the discussion with a small um, example which I cited a while ago. I was talking about the word order and when I say word order, my focus was on the subject, object and verb. These are the most um, commonly found units or most commonly found uh, items in a given language or phrases you can also call it. So, um, if you look at um, or if you, if you, if I want to focus on typological study, then primarily this has uh, two different, th this particular thought or this particular uh, idea has two different domains. First would be or one of the prominent domains are the functional uh, typological approach or you can say functional list typolo typological approach, which is also known as Greenbergian approach. And why we call it Greenbergian approach, I told you in the, in the just, just a few minutes ago, Greenberg um, in 1994, uh, sorry, Greenberg in 1954 had this seminal work on language universals, which gave a different direction to typological study. So, uh, he being the founding um, researcher of such a school of thought, we call functionalist typological approach as Greenbergian approach. And in his approach, um, he primarily follows the deductive method of language study. So, um, he, would, um, he would have a lot of samples and on the basis of the samples, when I say samples, I'm talking about the language samples. And on the basis of the language samples, he would draw some generalization. So, that method is known as the deductive method. So, you are trying to deduce um, a generalization uh, on the basis of the linguistic data or empirical data that you have in hand. That is why we call it, um, uh, so we, we primarily um, consider it a theory neutral language particular description based approach. It sounds a little heavy, but let us break it into uh, smaller parts. So, Greenbergian approach of typology, which is also known as functionalist typo typology, is a theory neutral approach. So, when I say theory neutral approach, I am talking about the empirical data set and the empirical data set is the linguistic data set here. So, he is not much focused on the um, theory of natural language. Rather, he is focusing on particular languages, not, not if you go back or if you can recall, I was talking about big L and small l. So, here Greenborgian focus or the focus of such school or the focus of such an approach is on the um, language particular phenomenon. So, uh, language particular, when I say language particular and it is eventually it becomes theory neutral approach and uh, this is Greenbergian story. The other side of the story is formal generative approach. We have Chomsky with us, uh, like this is mainly Chomskyan approach and uh, uh, this is diametrically opposite from um, Greenbergian story or from G Greenbergian approach. So, here what happens in the formal generative approach, um, we follow the inductive method of study. And when I say inductive method of study, we started from a generalization, then we try to test that using the linguistic samples or the data samples that we have in hand. So, uh, look, at, look at the difference, the huge difference that these two approaches have. In one hand, we have a deductive method where there is a huge sample size and on the basis of the samples or the data samples that you have, you are trying to draw the generalization. The other side of the story, you already have a concept in mind, you, you already um, have a theory in hand. So, this is not theory neutral, this is theory particular or it is basically theory sensitive. So, you have a theory to begin with and now what you are going to do, you want to test if your theory uh, can stand or if your theory can accommodate the varieties of data that is available, um, uh, which are available um, in various world's languages. So, this approach is known as formal generative approach. 
ok. So, um, let us keep these two approaches in mind and then we will move to how we are going to understand each of them in a much detail. I have already given you some idea about Chomskyan approach and my focus here is going to be considering this is a course appreciating linguistics uh, from a typological perspective. Um, I would primarily focus on the functionalist approach of typology and functionalist as I have just mentioned, functionalist approach of typology deals with language particular description. We are not really talking about uh, the generalizations here, the gen generalizations will surely come but not immediately but eventually. So, uh, here um, the study is going to be uh, related to particular languages and Haspelmuth 2005 which is a fairly recent work, he has extensively um, worked on this and uh, uh, what he is trying to understand or what the, the kind of research that he does, it is related to or it is based on the performance regularities. What is the performance regularity? How the languages, um, the different language sample, the different samples of languages that they have considered or that Greenberg has considered, how it, uh, how, how he tries to study the performance regularities of this language. So, what he does, he considers one linguistic phenomenon and he tries to find out the sample of languages that, that he has collected or the sample of languages that he is working on, whether this particular linguistic phenomenon has a performance regularity or not, whether this is regularly available in a, in a grand pool of languages or in a huge repository of languages. If it is found regularly available in most of the languages, that is considered to be sometimes a universal and there are different types of universals, we will go to these details a little later. But as of now, you just remember one of the four, like one of the pioneers of Greenbergian or functionalist typological research, uh, Greenberg, um, sorry Haspelmuth, Martin Haspelmuth. So, he would primarily focus on the performance regularities and what he does, he also provides system external um, explanation of universals. So, his universal, so the, the kind of language universals that uh, functionalist researchers like Greenberg would talk about, that is a system external, you are not really going to talk about what is the theory underlying structure, what is the internal structure, rather you are going to talk about how, how the language is used in the discourse, what kind of linguistic phenomena that you encounter when you are um, trying to understand um, the function of language in the discourse. And um, to understand this, like to figure out whether, uh, let us let us consider one linguistic phenomena, uh, like one linguistic phenomenon like um, word order which I was already talking about and we will see how we are going to segregate languages into different structural types. So, remember typology, the root word is type. So, our focus is going to be on language types. Some of the language are SOV, some are SVO, some others are OSV and OVA. So, there are six different patterns. So, um, and this kind of a research is generally done in three different levels. And what are the three different levels here? They like um, this typological work can be studied qualitatively. So, when I say qualitatively, I am trying to understand just the word order of different languages without really focusing on the number. I am just trying to figure out, okay, these are possible word orders given in the, um, like are found in the world's languages. So, that would be known as qualitative typology. So, if you look at the slides, it is we categorize languages according to a certain trait and what is the trait here? The trait here is the word order pattern. Then the second category or the second type of study um, in, the, in the same approach is quantitative typology. In quantitative typology, um, it is going to be um, not only we are trying to understand certain traits, we are also trying to understand how many of the languages have a particular trait, what is the number. So, the first one is about quality, the second one is about quantity. So, how many languages in the world they follow SOV pattern, how many languages follow SVO pattern and how many languages follow VSO pattern for that matter. A uh, sample that um, Haspelmuth and Dreyer 2005 please refer to their seminal work on this uh, issue um, with a sample size of like some 600 uh, languages or some Six, uh, it is not 600, it is I think a little more than that, maybe some 2000 languages that they studied. Out of that, 
their um, claim is that uh, approximately some 497 languages in the world, they have SOV pattern. So what is SOV pattern? SOV would be subject, object and verb. That is the Hindi type if you look at the South Asian languages. Me um, khana khati hu. So khati hu is the verb. Me is the subject. Khana is the khana which is food is the object. So I food eat. So that English has a different word order. So approximately 497 languages in the world they follow this pattern. On the other hand, um, 436 languages that they have studied uh, in their project, they follow SVO pattern like English. I eat food. So I is the subject, eat is the verb and food is the object. So that is, uh, that's, that's the number would be 436. Then we have the other category VSO and uh, they have listed some um, 85 languages that follow VSO. O pattern. Uh, so, if you look at uh, the six possible kinds of combination listed here, S V O, S O V, V O S, V S O, O S V, and O V S. Out of the six, the first two are the most commonly found ones, and the last two are the rarest ones in the um, world's languages. So, uh, if you look at SOV, um, most of the Asian languages except Southeast Asia and Middle East, they follow SOV pattern. Again, I am using or I am reiterating that most of the Asian languages, not all of them. So, only the Southeast Asia and then the Middle East, they have a different pattern but otherwise it is SOV. SVO, um, again English which is one of the most widely studied languages, all the Germanic languages, in the, not all, most of the Germanic languages, they do follow SVO. Besides that, we also have languages um, spoken in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, also the area that is extending from China to Southeast Asia, um, that, that includes the Austronesian languages in Indonesia and Western Pacific, Europe and, and around, around the Mediterranean Sea. All this area you will have languages following SVO pattern. So look at the look at the division now. SOV primarily Asia. SVO the rest of the uh, world. Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the area that includes China and Southeast Asia into the Austronesian languages of Indonesia plus the Western Pacific languages, European languages, Mediterranean languages, all of them they are following SVO. So that gives us an idea that these two types, SVO type and SOV type, these are the most widely found patterns in, um, like th these are most widely found typological patterns. Then we have VSO, um, that is primarily spoken in Eastern Africa, if you remember the number was like 85 I think and um, there are primarily it's uh, the Eastern uh, Sudanic languages. In um, North Africa, we have the Berber languages in the West, like in the Western extreme of Europe, that is the Celtic languages, um, in and around languages spoken in and around uh, Philippines. Um, these are some Polynesian languages, also some Polynesian languages of Pacific. Um, these are the places where you will find languages that follow VSO pattern. And uh, the two rarest types if I, the, that I mentioned, OSV and OVS. Uh, OVS is primarily spoken in the um, American, like the Native American, uh, the OVS pattern is primarily found in the Native American languages. Also the other languages spoken in Amazon basin and then, um, then uh, OSV generally that is spoken in Venezuela, Brazil and Northeastern Australia and Indonesia. So these are the rarest forms. So um, this is how we are, we are going to like, this is how we should understand when we say structural typology. So Greenbergian approach or the theory neutral language particular approach would focus on individual languages or would focus on, uh, focus on, focus on particular languages and they would try to understand um, or they would try to analyze the data and either the data is collected through the recordings 
or through questionnaires. So it depends on the researcher, what is the methodology that you want to adapt. And once the data has been collected, um, it has been uh, segregated and it has been um, the samples are being analyzed and on the basis of this analysis, we are going to understand which language belongs to which type. So, this is all this is about the qualitative and the, the quantitative typology. If you remember the third typology that I that I mentioned is theoretical typology. So, when I say theoretical typology, what does it do? So, um, qualitative typology typology deals with the deals with certain traits. Quantitative typology deals with the numbers that these traits they they are sort of associated with. Then finally, what does theoretical typology do? What is uh, what sort of work uh, we we should hope to encounter when we are talking about the theoretical typology? So theoretical typology primarily it attempts to um, have an explanation for the types. If I say SOV and SVO, and there are linguist there is a there is a difference in the linguistic um, phenomena of related to certain uh, languages. So then theoretical typology will ask the question why why such kind of uh, uh, difference occurs and how to account for this why. So, uh, generally this is done in a pragmatic term. Um, sometimes we try to understand if there is a language contact, language convergence, language divergence. So, um, if two different languages uh, like who which are bordering to each other, yet they have different word order, what could have been the possible reason? of such differences. And if two different language families, but they follow a certain type, what could be the possible reasons? So, these similarities and differences, they would be um, decided on the basis of certain language contact, language change and so basically some pragmatic factors. So, that would be the theoretical typology. So, for this particular co course, our focus is going to be functional typology, but then that does not mean that I will completely stay away from formal uh, generative typology, not really. I will primarily bring in um, language data and we are going to focus on the deductive method. We have the data, we will try to do the analysis and we will come up with the general generalization. That is how the assignments are going to be designed. So, um, that is all I can talk about uh, as far as typological um, studies concerned for, uh, for the natural language. So, my suggestion for you would be, be a linguist and appreciate this discipline. Uh, also, try to find out how you can contribute to enrich or to nourish this fairly younger discipline. Um, academically, we have very old disciplines like philosophy. So, if you compare it with philosophy, then it is going to be fairly a younger discipline. But then people like you and I, those who are the, uh, those who are practicing linguists, we can contribute for the, for the nourishment of such disciplines by appreciating it. And how you are going to appreciate? You are going to appreciate it by working on it. And my appreciation for the like for this particular course, I want you to appreciate linguistics following a typological approach. So, um, let us understand more about it and then let us gear up for some data that we want to collect. First, I will give you a sample data you need to analyze and after that you should collect the collect more data and then that is going to be the contact point between you and I and we have to do the analysis and we have to come up with some very basic generalizations considering this is going to be a preliminary foundation level course. So, I, I hope this is going to help you to understand linguistics as a discipline and once you understand it, you should be able to appreciate it even more. Thank you.